Shantanu Gore has been inspired and driven by his parents, brilliant and independent thinking immigrants from India. When it came time to choose between a career as a physician or as an entrepreneur, his mathematician father helped him calculate how many people he could help and what would happen if he failed. As co-founder and CEO of Alurion Technologies, Shantanu has helped develop and launch balloons, not into the sky, but into the stomach, where they help patients feel full and lose weight. The product is on the market in Europe and the Middle East, and there are plans for the U.S. and China as well. Alurion is succeeding where other weight loss balloons have failed. That's because the company's balloons can be swallowed and filled in an office visit, not an operating room, and they're paired with nutritional counseling and a digital support system. Shantanu shares his story in this latest episode of the Health Biz Podcast. I'm your host, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. We help fast-growing companies like Alurion make informed strategic choices. If your healthcare or life sciences company needs strategy consulting support, please contact me, dwilliams at healthbusinessgroup.com. Shantanu Gore, co-founder and CEO of Alurion Technologies. Thanks for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast. Really nice to be here, David. Thanks for having me. Listen, you're doing all sorts of stuff that's very exciting. It sounds like a birthday party with balloons and all that. We'll get to that in a minute, but let's actually go back to uh, early days um, and love to learn about your background. What was your upbringing like? What were your childhood influences all about? I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania uh, for most of my childhood. I was actually born in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, uh, while my dad was doing his PhD in mathematics. And I'm a child of immigrants. Uh, My parents grew up in India. Uh, My father was one of these uh, math prodigies from a a very young age and uh, sort of was discovered uh, as he grew up and was able to flex his math muscle on uh, greater and greater stages and uh, met my mom and had a love marriage in India back in the 70s, which was rare. Yeah, no Uh, kidding. And both of them were sort of rebels to begin with, and they knew that um, they had aspirations and ambitions uh, outside of what uh, they could potentially achieve in India. And so they uh, got up and left. Uh, And my father uh, came to Canada to do his PhD, and then my uh, family moved to Pittsburgh, uh, where I actually arrived on my first birthday. Uh, nice. 1987. So that's sort of where the journey begins. And uh, I'd say that, you know, that that sort of context of being the child of immigrants has has put a, a permanent imprint on my life uh, in terms of the values that uh, they taught me and um, and the values that I grew up with. Now, how young was your dad when he was kind of discovered? Like, did he was he sort of somebody was like age three, they'd invite him over and see what this guy could do? Or was it like when he was in high school or how did, how did it kind of come about? It was really in his high school days because that's really when you're able to take the examinations and have an have the ability to really compete uh, against sort of the other top talents and both my my parents come from very modest uh backgrounds and so at that point in india it was it was difficult to really rise to the top uh until you were at a stage where you were compared uh to the best and the brightest and it was really at that point where you know he knew that he had a special talent for mathematics uh and that was sort of validated in canada when he went to mcmaster which is one of the best universities in the world for uh, pure mathematics he finished his phd in just under two years uh sort of worked on uh, groundbreaking um topics in his field of pure math and uh that's what uh landed uh, an opportunity in the united states where uh you know we we really grew up you know there's all sorts of levels i i have a friend who's a uh, a senior uh, professor out at uh, berkeley and i grew up with and he was my lab partner uh in high school which is probably why i was always got an a in biology but i never really learned it that well um, and he told me the key for a, for a math PhD was to also have a one page thesis. Did your dad manage yeah. that as well? Or his, his, his thesis was a little bit longer. It was about 10 pages, but it was a okay. fraction of uh, the length of, uh, of his classmates. And he, he describes it as a, a problem that um, had been unsolved for quite some time. And he just had a breakthrough. You know, literally, he was thinking about the problem, thinking about it, thinking about it as mathematicians do. And you know, one night um, he woke my mom up and said, "I think I got it." He raced to the library, uh, jotted down his thoughts, and the next day he, he basically drafted his thesis, and that was that. So uh, that's the cloth from which I'm cut. And uh, you know, that's sort of 
the sort of intellectual horsepower has served me well. But as you can as you can imagine, you know, the the immigrant journey that they went on, my parents, that is, um, had all sorts of ups and downs. You know, despite both my mom and dad being incredibly bright and intelligent, um, there were challenges that they faced along the way. And that's where I get my grit, sort of the the determination, the the ability to go through the ups and downs of being an entrepreneur and not be phased. That's where you get a bit of audacity as well. Um, yeah. Just being able to think big and be ambitious, you know, sort of regardless of the of the consequences. Um, and that's where you also get, you know, the the work ethic and and just the intellectual horsepower as well. That I think was just passed on in, in, in my genes uh, from my parents. But everything else was sort of uh, nurture over nature. I just saw uh, yeah. how much they fought and struggled and succeeded. And that stuck with me. Well, yeah, I'm a big proponent of uh, immigration and have written about it for a long time uh, in my blog. And, and one of the th biggest concerns that I have, actually, frankly, kind of post 9-11, uh, in the U.S. is that, you know, reduction of immigration is actually going to be the biggest self-inflicted wound we can do in terms of economic growth and productivity and just kind of the um, the level of foment uh, in society. I'm involved with a lot of innovative companies, and they're mostly run by immigrants. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily a genetic, right? It's a uh, it's, it's, it has to do with the situation somebody finds himself in, um, <clears throat> how hard you pursue things and, uh, what it takes to, you know, to, to overcome and to do something, uh, differently. Um, so big, uh, big believer there. So in terms of your own education, um, I was gonna say, you know, why do you study biology? I guess you had, you couldn't, math was taken, so you had to do something <laughs> different, but, uh, you know, why biology? And then at what point did you figure out that, you know, medical school is in your future? I, I really loved biology from uh, the get-go, uh, and back in 2001, when I was in high school, that was when the human genome was sequenced, and that was one of the big stories in biology, and it had so much promise that I think only now, 20 years later, we're starting to scratch the surface of, of what uh, the sequencing of the human genome could actually do for us as a society. But back then, there was a lot of uh, hopes and aspirations around this, and it was sort of infectious uh, as, a, as a young kid. You, you read about it in the news, you learn about it in the classroom, and that's really what got me into biology. I actually wrote an essay for an essay contest as an eighth grader, um, sponsored by this nonprofit uh, called the Genetic Alliance, of which now I, I serve on the board. Nice. And the, the title of the essay contest was, what does the sequencing of the human genome mean to you? Uh, and so I, I wrote about some of the things that I hoped uh, the human genome sequencing would lead to in terms of research and discovery and new medicines and really talked a bit about in my eighth grade language at the time what transla translational medicine has become. And at that uh, award ceremony where I you know, picked up my certificate, it was in D.C., I got a chance to meet Francis Collins, who's now the, the director of the NIH. And I also met a woman from the University of Pittsburgh who worked uh, in the human genetics department. And she invited me to come down as an eighth grader when I got back home to Pittsburgh to see if I wanted to just shadow and maybe do some research. And I ended up you know, uh, working in a wet lab there as a, as a freshman in high school. And uh, did some really interesting work actually on uh, prostate cancer in Trinidad and Tobago. It turns out males in Trinidad and Tobago have an incredibly high rate of prostate cancer. So I studied a few uh, genes and genetic markers that may uh, contribute to that susceptibility, entered, it, entered that research into a bunch of science competitions, which sort of fulfilled or sort of um, reinforced my interest in biology. Um, and sort of like my father, when he was in high school and started to sort of compete and, and, and take tests and examinations to sort of flex his muscle. That was my opportunity to um, gauge my interest in biology, and I loved it. Uh, and so I decided to pursue that as a major uh, at Harvard, and uh, that sort of naturally led to an interest in medicine, uh, again, stemming back, extending from uh, my interest in, in human genetics. Uh, and then very quickly, uh, after I got into medical school and started uh, to become even more interested uh, in medicine, uh, that's sort of when uh, Allurion came to be. Got it. Now, with the Human Genome Project, was it Francis Collins himself whose genome it was that was sequenced as part of that? It was like, a, am I remembering that right, or is that? <laughs> I, I'm not sure, actually. I don't believe it was his own uh, genome. Okay. I think they had volunteers. Uh, somewhere along the way, I'm sure he's had his own yeah, genome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I could be remembering that wrong. I'll fact check that before we uh, before we include it in the in the podcast. Now, most people, Shantanu, go to medical school with the idea of becoming a doctor, and not to say that you're not a doctor, but most people go into clinical practice or at least think they're going to do that. Is that what you thought when you're going into medical school, and how quickly did that change? Yeah, that was the intention uh, from day one: is to really uh, go into medical school with the intention of becoming a doctor and eventually starting my own research lab. When I entered medical school, I was still very interested in basic science research, wet lab research. And I thought, you know, Harvard Medical School would be the perfect place to understand what the uh, critical problems are in clinical medicine, take them back to the laboratory, and then hopefully one day translate laboratory discoveries back into the clinic. And in my first year of medical school, uh, I ended up uh, becoming friends with uh, my co-founder in Allurion, Samuel Levy. And Sammy and I got very interested in other unmet needs in healthcare that wouldn't necessarily be solvable in a laboratory setting. And what we understood at that point as students was we had a tremendous opportunity at Harvard Medical School every day in our lectures, we would hear from faculty members, not just at Harvard, but from around the globe, who are at the cutting edge of their fields. And we kept a, a running list of their frustrations, the problems they cited in their lectures. And we uh, kept that running list for the first two years of medical school. And the problem that kept on coming up again and again was obesity. It seemed to impact every single aspect of the healthcare system, be it cardiovascular disease, diabetes, infertility, something called NASH or fatty liver disease now. It was central to all of those issues. It was also central to mental health issues um, and other more systemic issues in our healthcare system that we're now seeing uh, the effects of after COVID-19. And so we got very interested in obesity. And what we realized was that there was surgical options there were also diet and exercise, more lifestyle options, and there were certain pharmacotherapy options. But the big elephant in the room was no one wants uh, really a bariatric surgery if they can avoid it. And the weight loss medications or drugs had all sorts of side effects. So could we create something that was non-surgical without the side effects of those medications but still lead to life-changing weight loss? That was sort of the genesis of Allurion, uh, and that's why we started the company as medical students. Now. When we started Allurion, there was a point where Sammy and I both intended to potentially you know, go off and become residents and finish our medical training. Uh, but I took a year off um, in the middle of medical school to really focus on Allurion full time. I loved uh, what I was able to do uh, in that year. We got um, you know, benchtop testing done. We raised a bit of capital. And at the end of that year, uh, we started our first human clinical trial in Europe. And once we got the results of that first human clinical trial, which were you know, very promising, very early, but very promising, I sat down with my dad and I was talking to him about this decision of, okay, now it's, it's time to make a call. Do I continue on with my training and become a doctor or do I um, go forward with Allurio? And you know, being the brilliant guy he is and, and very analytical, he said, well, it's actually a pretty easy choice in my mind. You, know, you have two options. Becoming a doctor, very fulfilling and very rewarding career. You will probably be able to see 20 to 30 patients a day, five days a week for 30 years in your career. So you're talking about touching the lives of tens of thousands of people, maybe over 100,000 people in your career, which is extremely rewarding. If you go forward and build a business that actually delivers weight loss to people, you could impact the lives of billions of people. You could also impact the lives, lives of no one because right. startups fail and they never get to market. So one path almost assuredly gives you a fulfilling career, very rewarding career, very low risk. The second path, much higher impact, riskier, obviously. And so choose, do you want to maximize your career for impact? Or do you want to maximize it for a little bit more comfort, but with a fair degree of reward? And then he cautioned me. He said, the one thing I don't want you to do, and this is where sort of the immigrant mindset comes in. I don't want you to say no to becoming an entrepreneur because you're worried about failing as an entrepreneur. Because look at the pedigree you have. Look at the background that you have. Even if a learning fails, you'll go on to do something else that potentially could change the world. And when he put it like that, 
it, the choice was clear. It yeah. was take the risk, build the business, and go big. Uh, and that's again, that's that's I think that's just in our DNA. It's in his DNA. It's in my mom's DNA as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I was going to ask you about sort of what the family thought. I interviewed another um, CEO on the podcast, uh, CEO of Prognos, and he came from an Indian family, and he said, you know, he studied all this sort of stuff. And he says his, his parents were fine with it. as long as he became like a you know physician, as long as they was studying medicine, he could study all this other stuff too along on the <laughs> on the side of it. So it's an interesting uh, conversation. They gave him a certain degree of flexibility, and he took it he took it in the right uh, direction. And what about um, you know uh, Sammy? Did he have a similar kind of a you know kind of a discussion? Because usually you know get into Harvard Medical School, and the parents are relieved. You know, my son's going to be a doctor, et cetera. And then it turns out he's going to be something else. You know, all all together. Did that how did that go? And it's not just family, but just in terms of one's own ideas about it. Yeah, Sammy, I think went through a very similar uh, conversation with his family. He and I talked about it at great length with one another, and the fact that we did it together, honestly, was the biggest comfort um, that I received because. You know, we could always point to one another as sharing that risk and taking the leap together. Uh, and if if he weren't there or if I wasn't there, uh, it would be very difficult uh, for us to, to take that leap. But we did it together. We had conviction in what we were doing at Allurion. And we had really worked our butts off over the course of our medical school training to put Allurion in a position so that when we do make that leap, it was going to be successful. Um, and so if for all the right reasons, I think we decided to stick with Allurion and, and here we are yeah. um, eight years later um, reaping the rewards. So I was going to say, you know, eight years later or so, it's also about if you decide to be a neurosurgeon, to be almost done with your training as well. So maybe you maybe you didn't put yourself uh, put yourself back. But what's the trajectory been like if we, without going through all of those eight years, if you think about where you are now and look back eight years, is this sort of roughly where you expected to be, or did you say, hey, success is going to come here in five minutes, or it's going to take even longer? You know, where where are you now compared to what you were originally thinking and sort of how you thought about it along the way? Yeah, when you look back at some of the early fundraising decks we had uh, from you know six, seven years ago, uh, the trajectory that we've been on is actually pretty accurate and pretty true to what we had projected it to be. Uh, obviously, certain things along the way from a timeline perspective, um, you know, ebb and flow. Uh, but more or less, you know, when we set out to start Allurion, we told folks that we were building something that was uh, going to revolutionize the weight loss space. It would take several years of R&D and clinical studies, uh, which it did. Um, and it would take some time to start getting uh, approvals in key markets, which it did. Uh, and in 2016, when we got approval uh, for our device in Europe, that's really when the floodgates started to open. And that was, I think, one of the most important transitions we made as a business from one that was wholly consumed with research and development and clinical trials to one now that was a commercial enterprise. And you know this probably even better than, than I do, that that is a, um, that's a peculiarity, not a peculiarity, that is typical of a medical device company. All of a sudden, you start booking revenue, and that's where the attention, at least in terms of outsiders, uh, begins to turn. Um, for a lot of biotech companies, you're in R&D and clinical for most of the life cycle. Yeah. Yes. Um, so once that transition happened, uh, then we were able to sort of reforecast and, and figure out, OK, now that we are commercial, what does the revenue trajectory look like? And we were very audacious and very ambitious from the get go. You know, we wanted uh, to build a business that could at least double every year because we were out there talking to people about how big of an opportunity obesity was. So certainly once we were to launch this product in the marketplace, we should see a very steep curve. And on, on those forecasts, we have delivered to a T. Now, Allurion makes uh, balloons for weight loss. And there have been some other companies that do something that, that sounds similar. And um, some of them haven't done a great job. Um, and as a result, the reputation of balloons for weight loss isn't all that great. So how has that affected you? And, and more importantly, maybe, like, how are you different from some of those others? Yeah, as the saying goes, if it were easy, it would already have been done. And I, I think these predecessors of ours have taught us very valuable lessons. Um, first is when you're <clears throat> creating a medical device, the way it's administered and the interactions that the patient has with their provider are critical. 
And we live in a world today where healthcare consumers want limited invasiveness. They don't want to go to the hospital. They don't want to take time off from work. They want something easy and frictionless. And we learned from some of these previous companies who had balloon technologies that were actually safe and, and pretty effective, but required invasive endoscopies and anesthesia to deliver, and then endoscopy and anesthesia to remove. And if things didn't go right, sometimes surgery was required to remove their products. And that was just a non-starter for us. We knew that if we were going to go down this path and innovate in this space, that we would need to develop something procedureless. And so our balloon is swallowed in a capsule attached to a thin tube. The tube is used to fill the balloon. It's filled in a 15 minute office visit, no anesthesia, no sedation required. And then four months later, that balloon that was sitting inside your stomach, helping you feel full and helping you retrain your lifestyle opens on its own and passes out of the body. And that opening technology, what we call the release valve, is really where the heart of our intellectual property is. And um, that allows us to create a proceduralist experience. Every other balloon that has come before us, you need to go back to the doctor and have the balloon removed. So the technology is really differentiating. That proceduralist technology is differentiating. And then we created an experience around the balloon, which is, I think, what our predecessors had failed to do. You know, previously, you could get a another balloon, it's endoscopically placed, endoscopically removed, but if you can sort of overcome that hurdle, you get your balloon and that's it. That's the end of the story. The balloon sits in your stomach, maybe you follow a diet, maybe you don't, and then the balloon comes out six months later, and a lot of people didn't lose that much weight. Right. And so from day one, our intention was to deliver a balloon to someone, but then surround them with two very important things. One is a nutritional program that helps them modify their lifestyle and take advantage of this device that's sitting inside their stomach, helping them feel full. And the second was a digital platform because you know, as Sammy and I were growing up at Harvard Medical School, we were going through this digital health revolution where people were asking for their data, demanding their data. They want to see it. They want to feel it in real time. And so we knew that whatever weight loss experience we created must have a digital component where people on an app can see exactly what their weight loss trajectory is. And so every one of our patients to this day gets our Bluetooth scale. They get our health tracker smartwatch, which follows their activity and exercise and sleep. And all of that data is integrated into a digital experience that they can touch and feel. So those three pillars, our digital platform, our nutritional program, and a procedureless balloon is how we have created our weight loss experience. And we, we've we differentiated ourselves from those that have come before us from day one. Yeah, that's great. And I think you know, it's interesting on the technology side, um, Sometimes people have a technological differentiation that the patient doesn't necessarily see or experience. Here, it's very direct because you know proceduralist is a is a big deal uh, compared to going to the endoscopy suite. And then you've got these other elements that more traditionally we've thought about as the experience, you know, in terms of the nutritional side of it and the digital platform, and that all goes well together. You were contrasting what you're doing before with what you see on the biotech in terms of the life cycle and time to market and so on. Another thing that's different is a biotech product typically would be put on the market in the U.S. first, whereas devices are different. And you talked about Europe a little bit, but I also know um, that you've done things differently also uh, with the Persian Gulf being an interesting uh, early market. I'd be interested in Europe, but also kind of Persian Gulf. And since you're doing something that's not just technological, but is also related to the experience, how is this overall kind of experience with weight loss different in that part of the world? Yeah, great question. And, you know, Europe was obviously where we started, um, where we got our regulatory approval. But very quickly, we started uh, branching out to other territories in the world. The Middle East was uh, number one on our list uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, first, the rates of obesity and diabetes in the Middle East are the highest uh, any, than anywhere compared to anywhere in the world. And that's due to a variety of factors. One is it's a relatively wealthy population. And so uh, they have all of the, unfortunately, all of the health issues that afflicts uh, middle-class and upper middle-class individuals. 
they have access to uh, all sorts of uh, highly processed food, um, and they lead a very sedentary lifestyle. Uh, you know, not not least because it's just so hot uh, for most of the year. It's very difficult to have a very active outdoors type lifestyle. There's also very little agriculture there, so you're not you're you don't really have access to organic foods that are that are nationally low in calorie. You are you are really uh, eating a lot of processed foods if you look at the typical Middle Eastern diet today in today's day and age. And so for all those reasons, it was a, a hotbed for obesity and diabetes. And so we sort of used our CE mark, our European approval, to get approval into those countries. And the Middle East very quickly in the early days became our top market uh, for, for all of those drivers, for all of those reasons. There was also a, uh, a pre-existing, I'd say, market of uh, weight loss devices and weight loss surgery in the Middle East uh, that was uh, far and above what you would see in Europe in terms of maturity. And so we came into a fairly mature market with a great consumer base, with a better product, a better experience. And what we were able to actually demonstrate is not only can we get weight loss in that population that begins to approximate what you would get with weight loss surgery, what we realized is the Middle East in terms of um, sort of cultural and technological norms is highly, I would say, um, uh, highly interested uh, yeah. in anything that is digital. Uh, and they latch on to digital platforms very quickly, both from a marketing perspective and also from a consumer perspective. So our top physicians and top accounts in the Middle East immediately started advertising our technology on, on Snapchat, on Instagram, on Twitter and Facebook. And they had huge followings and yeah. that sort of drove uh, a lot of the interest in our technology. And then, of course, consumers, um, you know, all have smartphones there and they love seeing their data and they love sharing their weight loss data with their with their providers. Um, so we got excellent results in the Middle East, had an excellent experience. Uh, now, Europe is our biggest market just because it's a bigger territory, right. has a deeper total addressable market than the Middle East. Um, but in terms of the early days, the Middle East is really where you know we were able to see traction in the business early on. So uh, my brother was actually a physician in a Northern Navajo Medical Center out in Shiprock, New Mexico. And we talked at one point about you know, what was going on with the, with the Navajo, so much uh, obesity and diabetes. And a similar story, I think, to you know, the Persian Gulf. We had people that had been nomadic and were used to essentially wandering around and having almost no food and evolving to be able to handle that to all of a sudden sedentary Kentucky Fried Chicken right down the street and you know, just amazing. I remember going like to the swimming pool there and you see like very obese people that are ac active people, but um, it's just not, you know, just we're not ready for, uh, you know, what has come come upon them. And I know that, you know, before you went into the Middle East, you had these big, uh, you know, like uh, Joslin Diabetes Center and everybody was, was over there because I think the rulers of the countries were worried about what were they going to do about diabetes with an, you know, with an aging population. Um, and so it sounds like you're, you're helping out in that regard. That's right. And, you know, diabetes and obesity in the Middle East is unfortunately impacting life expectancy uh, in the elderly, but there's also an epidemic in adolescents and teenagers. And the problem, if anything, is only continuing to get worse. And so the governments there have been very supportive of what we are doing, but also supportive of other interventions from a public health perspective that can um, really make an impact on, on that issue because it's beginning to hurt. It already has hurt the economy. Yeah. It will continue to hurt uh, the economy in the years to come. So Europe and, you know, the Middle East, those are great places, of course. But um, the U.S., you know, we have obesity problem here. So where, where's the balloon? Yeah. <laughs> we are working with the FDA right now on um, getting the balloon approved. Uh, obviously, in the United States, uh, there are different regulations uh, for medical devices, especially for weight loss. And there's also been, I'd, I'd say, an evolution in how FDA thinks about weight loss devices. Certainly, the, the past is a bit checkered uh, with weight loss medications like FenFen -Fen, um, that had their issues. The first intragastric balloon uh, in the United States back in the 1980s, which was not a very well-designed product, um, didn't uh, survive on the U.S. market uh, for regulatory reasons. And of course, some of the competitors that you mentioned 
um, had a very up and down experience in the U.S. from a safety profile standpoint. So we're working through all of um, you know that past history with the FDA, but we continue to believe that our balloon is truly differentiated from everything that's come before us, and it's just a matter of time before uh, we're able to open up w- what will be the largest market in the world. I will say one thing that the U.S. Uh, obviously will be a large market, but uh, China is a- another massive yes. opportunity for us. Um, the obesity epidemic in China continues to spiral. Uh, the government in China has declared obesity and diabetes two of their top initiatives over the next 10 years for a health, healthy China 2030. Um, obesity and diabetes are at the top of the list. And when you actually look at the number of adults with obesity in China compared to the United States, um, by 2030, there will actually be two times more uh, yeah. adults in China with obesity than the United States. So in parallel with the work that we're doing in the United States, we're also kicking off that same work in China. Um, So over the next couple of years, we may very well open up uh, two of the largest markets in the world. Great. We'll look forward to staying tuned for that. We'll have to do a follow-up podcast uh, at that point. In the meantime, um, you know, during the pandemic, uh, any chance to do any uh, any reading, any books that you uh, may recommend to to our listeners, or books you recommend to like stay away from because it was a waste of time. <laughs> Good question. Uh, I did have a chance to to read a lot over the pandemic, but I'm an avid reader regardless. I um, recently finished uh, a book called Grit, actually by Angela Duckworth. Yeah, a wonderful read for aspiring entrepreneurs and current entrepreneurs because. Um, you know, her central thesis, uh, not to spoil the book, is that, you know, grit uh, is as important, if not more important than just raw intellectual intelligence uh, in getting things done, especially challenging problems that startup founders need to solve. Um, and then I, I recently uh, finished up uh, a book by Eric Larson called The Splendid and the Vile. Uh, it's about World War II, specifically from Churchill's eyes. Uh, Churchill is uh, one of the folks I looked up, look up to uh, as an entrepreneur, especially um, when times are tough, um, because the way he handled uh, the German onslaught um, was commendable uh, under such uh, high degrees of pressure. He was able to shepherd the British people and in the background, do some very savvy negotiating with the United States to basically convince us to save Europe uh, from from yeah. from the Germans. So, um, two fantastic reads uh, that I highly recommend to anyone. Great, to to the Splendid podcast. and the Vile. Actually, I hadn't heard of before, but another guest actually recommended that one. So, oh, wonderful! Uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of Eric Larson, starting yeah. with the Devil in the White City, which is just an amazing tale. I guess the truth is stranger than fiction, uh, and just you know the way he he writes historical fiction is is wonderful. It's a real joy. Great. Well, Shantanu Gore, CEO and co-founder of Alurion Technologies, thanks so much for being a guest on the Health Biz Podcast. Thank you for having me, David. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.